Hello, everyone. This is uh, Carol Collins, Nancy Boyle's editor here at Norton Books and Education. Um, we're so pleased that so many of you have registered and so proud to sponsor Nancy's presentation with Ed Webb this afternoon. Um, by way of background, W.W. W. Norton is the largest independent and employee-owned publisher in the U.S., and our line of professional development books for K through 12 teachers and administrators is designed to help educators meet the challenges of teaching with confidence and joy. We welcome you to browse our latest spring and summer titles and are happy to offer 20% off and free shipping on these books to viewers of this webinar. Of course, you can view our entire list of offerings on our website and follow us on social media. Um, our blog, k-12talk.com, is currently featuring a special series of daily posts about online teaching, which may be of interest to those of you who are transitioning to teaching from home during the COVID school closings. Um, and now, without further ado, I'll turn the screen and audio over to the presenter you're waiting to hear from <laughs> about how to spark conversations with students about social emotional skills through the reading and discussion of picture books. Nancy Boyles, writer, former teacher, literacy consultant, and author, among other books, of Classroom Reading to Engage the Heart and Mind. So let me just get started with this. And um, so you can see that what we're going to be talking about today is building students' personal strength. Um, and certainly that's always a good topic, something that's always on our mind. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think now it's on our mind even more than ever. Um, what you see in the left panel is um, the cover of my new book which actually just published today. And um, so this is really a content presentation, not just about the book, but certainly the book is there to support your work with Cell if you choose. My email is also there for people that want to get in touch and also my Twitter handle in case people feel like tweeting about this. So I just wanted you to know that you have this. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of shout outs. First of all, to W.W. Norton, for being not only the publisher of my book, but also um, for um, sponsoring uh, the webinar here this afternoon, to Creative Commons for um, the use of the images, and to EdWeb for the tech support. Um, and we certainly could not have done this without that support. So thank you to all of, of those. I just wanna mention that there is um, also a handout, and I will be sort of referring to the handout. It's nothing that you have to have, um, present, um, but if you are able to sort of toggle back and forth between the handout and the presentation, you'll be able to sort of keep up with, you know, what I'm talking about. I've also um, presented, or I've also provided um, as the final page in the handout, I've given you just um, a copy of what the quiz is in case you want to just get a jump start on what those questions are. So, um, so I'm just going to go ahead here now. And, you know, what I would say is um, it, it certainly does take a village for anything that we do in education and certainly for what we do for sell. Um, all the usual suspects are up there. And I expect if you're watching this webinar that you fall into one of those categories. I, however, added a category um, to this, which is parents, because overnight parents have become their kids teachers. And so I'm just thinking that some of the information that I share with you this afternoon might be useful to parents as well. So um, certainly feel free to share um, uh, book titles with them, um, strategies, other things so that we can all kind of work together um, as a team. So the agenda for this afternoon really pretty much follows also the path of the book. So at the beginning, we'll just say a few quick things about sort of a, building a context for sale. And then we will talk about um, competencies and focus areas, and that will be the, the really concrete takeaways. My goal in doing any kind of a PD session is for you to have lots of practical things to take back. So I'm hoping that this meets that standard too. We will especially be talking about um, books and messages and how they can be used with, with children of different ages. So just to get us started here, let's just talk for a second about what's the big deal about social emotional learning, because all of a sudden it seems to be everywhere on um, the landscape in terms, in terms of um, schools. So first of all, our kids clearly need support um, with things in the cell area. And as you see some of the bullet points there, I'm sure we all have things that we consider our priorities. 
I would say that mine might be sort of just the idea of kids that are just dealing with anger and frustration. I see so much of that, even down to the kindergarten level, where kids in some cases just can't even function in a classroom. So, you know, up until the past couple of weeks, I would have said um, that that was really pretty much at the top of my list. Now, however, I might add just the notion of coping because overnight, these kids' world just became topsy-turvy. They're home from school. Their parents are there. Parents may be out of the job. Um, the, um, they cannot see their friends. I mean, there's just a lot of day-to-day -day stuff that really is critical. And so um, I think um, that just helping kids cope with some with with things on a day to day basis also becomes a big priority right now. Um, the second reason that I would would suggest is we are way overdue, um, and and this has been sort of a um, a growing concern for the last ten years. Um, we had brand new standards, then we sort of had close reading to achieve those standards, then we had depth of knowledge to see how well we were all doing with close reading, and somewhere along the way. Kids sort of became their scores. And we've got to get back to really looking at the whole child and really thinking, yes, of course, about academics and about cognitive things, but also about the emotional needs of kids. And so I think the current focus on cell really does help to um, put that is, um, issue more front and, and center. The third reason is, hey, you know, we can do this. We have plenty of people, and notice that's in quotes, um, mentors to help us. And as you look at this list here, you probably notice a few names that you recognize, people people like uh, uh, Lou Gehring, uh, Ruby Bridges, but there's lots of sort of fictional people, if you will, up there too. And what I would say is really all the support that we need to get these conversations going is really no further away than your school library or the the bookshelf in your classroom. So really accessing some of the books that we have, maybe getting a few new ones, um, can really support the work that we want to do around cell. Um, so let's just think for a second about what is this thing called social emotional learning? In your handout on page two, and you'll always notice that if it's in the handout that I've identified um, just the page where you can find it there. But I've provided um, a definition of social emotional learning um, and certainly do take the time to go through that um, when you have some time to do so. But what I really want to point out right now is the website where this came from. It's from the CASEL site. And as you can see there, CASEL stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. Um, and, and I would characterize CASEL as sort of the, uh, the, the biggest clearinghouse you'll find for all things sell. You will find blog posts, you will find um, research reviews, you will find invitations to webinars, um, you will find program reviews, you'll find, you'll find just so many, so many different kinds of things that can support you on your journey to really incorporate cell into um, classroom life. I think the thing that I like best about um, the Castle site is the framework that they provide for um, cell competencies and skills. So just to really kind of zero on this slide for a minute, and what you'll see is that there are five broad areas. Um, the first two, self-awareness and self-management, have to do with self. Um, social awareness and relationships and social skills, that has to do with sort of the social aspect of it. And then responsible decision-making sort of crosses both categories. Of course, in some sense, they, they all interconnect, but we're just talking about the main focus. So I think that, that this is a really useful framework. I do, however, think that this is pretty broad. And what I'm saying is um, it would be hard to teach a lesson on, for example, social awareness or relationships and social skills or any of these things, because they're just so big, we can think of a hundred things that we might want to include um, in, in you know, talking about these areas. So what um, CASEL did is they then broke this framework down into not just the five main areas, but under each main competency, 
four, five, six different sort of um, focus areas. And those do become more teachable. So that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon are some of those focus areas that in particular have to do with personal strength. Um, I really like this little quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compares to what lies within us. Certainly, um, I think that's particularly appropriate now. I also just want to draw your attention to the photograph. Um, I live at the tip of Cape Cod. That's not my house. But um, that, um, that picture was taken, I think, in January when we took a beach walk. And I just want to point out that it's not all that hard to social distance on Cape Cod when it's the off season. So um, anyway, that's just um, kind of a, you know, a small aside here. So today's target would really be six, six focus areas. And um, they all have to do with personal strength. So what we will talk about in this basic order will be feelings. Um, a positive view of self, confidence, managing impulses, setting goals, and um, communicating. So we'll talk about those um, and, and incorporate questions for teachers, um, books and their message, and questions for kids. Um, so let me just, um, so, th so this is the, the first area, um, self-awareness that I mentioned earlier. And you can see that under this heading that there are five different focus areas. We're going to talk about the three that are in red. I mean, they're all important, but we had to sort of limit this, you know, based on our time. So I like to think of this as um, the you've got the power um, competency, because that's what we want kids to feel. That in fact, they, they are empowered and they can find that power within themselves. So I think it's great to begin with some questions that we want to consider professionally. Um, because I think we need to just um, think about um, what what we would perhaps consider our priorities. So a couple of things um, that I am thinking about here is how can I help my kids develop more precise labels for feeling words? Because in fact, um, kids kids are very general often when they talk to you about their feelings. They feel sad or bad or mad. When in fact, you know, maybe they're feeling disappointed or discouraged or depressed or frustrated. So there's so many nuances that are um, that would really help us to help them better if we could just get to those labels a little bit more precisely. Um, I'd also I also think, you know, it's not just about the names of the feelings and what the feelings are. It's how kids respond to their feelings. So looking at questions like number three there. What kinds of feelings problems should, should students try to solve independently versus what's noted in four there, the kinds of problems that require maybe a helper? So every time you see that little dude in the corner or wherever he appears, these are things that I would like you especially to think about, either on your own or with colleagues, however you choose to do so. Also, the page number there indicates that in the handout that that question is on a chart that is in your handout too. So um, in terms of just naming feelings, um, you can find charts in so many different places. I love this little quote by Mark Brackett. I am, I did not, I was not the inventor of this, um, of, of this really poignant phrase, but he says, if you can name it, you can tame it. And so I think that that's just kind of a good thought to keep in mind, excuse me, as we sort of move forward with what those precise feelings are. Um, and in terms of books, I'll start by talking about this book here, When Sophie Gets Angry, Really, Really Angry. This book, um, in fact, is sort of a primary book. But one of the things that I want to point out in terms of sell is that um, for all of the books that I'll share, that it's not just about the pretty pictures and the cute little story. It's about the message. And that's why even a book that you might think of as something for younger kids, when you're talking about cell, can potentially be used for older kids too. So this is the story of a little girl who um, is, um, is uh, playing with her brother and they get into this tussle over a toy and she actually kind of loses out, at which point she has a complete meltdown and she screams and she hollers and all the bad stuff that we associate with that kind of thing. But then she sort of smartly takes herself out of the situation. She goes, to, to a tree and she, I can't remember, she either sits in the tree or um, 
She sits uh, next to the tree and one way or another, she um, is able to kind of calm herself down and she then goes home. So, um, so, and everybody's happy to see her and life kind of continues. So the point of this is here that she sort of figures out that she can solve this problem by herself. And I think that that's a great message for kids. And, and something that we can really talk with them about is what are the kinds of problems and what are some strategies that you can use to solve problems on your own? Um, compare that to this book, Thunder Cake. This book is by Patricia Polacco. And as we talk this afternoon, um, I'll not only mention books, but I'll mention some authors. She should really be on your short list of just authors that are really great for sell. Um, and in this story, this is different in, in the way this problem gets handled. Because this little girl is, it, um, she's with her grandmother and there's a thunderstorm brewing outside and she's deathly afraid of thunderstorms. So she goes to her gram and her grandmother says, you know, let's make a thunder cake. So they, um, they do. And while, while the thunder is crashing and the rain is pounding, they're too busy enjoying their time together making the cake um, to really be bothered by this. So this is a good example of, you know, sometimes it's really good to have help solving a feelings problem. So I sort of envision with kids, you know, making two lists. One, problems you can solve by yourself. One, um, then a second one, problems where you could use a little support. So these are just simple things that we can do um, to begin um, to sort of address things that have to do with cell. Um, this book, um, I'm also going to suggest to you sort of a short list of books that you may not have yet, but that you would probably want. And I would absolutely put this one on the list. Um, the Rabbit Listened is the title. And it's about this little child. The name is Taylor. You're not sure whether it's a boy or a girl. But Taylor has just built the most magnificent um, block tower. And he, he, she, whatever, is admiring this. And all of a sudden, the thing comes crashing down. Well, just distraught is this child. So in come a variety of different animals um, that try to support him. The first one is the chicken, and it's like, cluck, cluck, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And But Taylor doesn't feel like talking about it, so the chicken leaves. Then in comes a bear, grrr, and the bear is very angry and just wants to be angry and, and, and have a fit about it. But Taylor doesn't even really feel like being all that angry. And then in comes an elephant who says, well, you know, if we can just remember exactly how this was built, we can build it again. But this is still too much for Taylor. So the elephant also leaves and in comes um, the rabbit. And the rabbit just kind of sits at a distance at first and then gets a little closer and a little closer. And finally, um, finally, they sort of have a little chat and they do talk about it. And, you know, Taylor is a bit angry. And then he wants to remember exactly what happened. So um, the message here, I think, is sometimes just being there for a friend is the best comfort. What a great message for now when, you know, everybody is sort of confined to their homes and patience is probably at a premium. Um, and so just being there to hear our kids um, is important. As a teacher, anything you can do online to um, promote that. And, you know, this isn't certainly just a kid to kid message, but a parent to child message, a teacher to child message. So, you know, just a wonderful book to add to your collection if you feel so inclined. Um, um, so the the featured book for feelings um, is uh, Mercedes and the Chocolate Pilot. And by featured book, I mean, it's not only described in my book, but there's also some other um, classroom supports that go with this. So in order to talk about the message, I first want to talk about the story. This is a post-World War II story. It happens in Berlin. Um, and it's actually a true story of the candy bomber. And the candy bomber, as he was flying over Berlin to drop um, supplies, um, and this was due to the blockade, the Russian blockade at the time, but not only dropped essential you know, groceries and things like that, but also candy for the children. And Mercedes, the little girl that you saw in the picture on the, on the cover, um, was very excited about this. And so she, along with all the children, typically went to Tempelhof Air Base. And you see that picture there in the middle. 
And so she, she gathered with the other kids, but she was never lucky enough to be able to get the candy. So she decides, well, this just isn't working. So she sends a letter to the pilot, and you can see in the lower left, there's that little picture there. And she says, you know, she says, I keep trying to get this candy. It's not working out. Maybe you could just like drop it as you're flying over my yard. You'll know the one. It's the one with the chickens. Well, he doesn't think this is going to be so successful. So he decides he's going to package her up, uh, you know, a little bit of candy, and he writes her a note, and he sends it off. Well, she gets the candy, and of course, she's very happy, and then the story ends, and you think, oh, what a nice story. Well, then the real, to me, most meaningful part of the story happens in the epilogue. So this original scene, you know, story took place in 1948, but now it's 1973, and the little girl is now an adult. She herself is a pilot and is um, stationed at Tempelhof, and back comes the same <clears throat> pilot who is now in charge of the base. And you can see his picture there in the bottom right. So she knows who he is. He doesn't know who she is. And he invites him, she invites him to her house to have dinner. And in the course of it, brings out this note that he wrote her, you know, 25 years ago. And he is, of course, stunned. And she just looks at him and says, um, so you just have no idea the hope that you brought to so many children. And I, I think that this just reminds us, and not just for now, but for now also, is that how important hope is for kids. And so what I would encourage you to do is to think about hope and to think about what books do you have? In fact, it doesn't have to be a picture book. It could be a chapter book. It could be a song. It could be a poem. It could be any number of things. Um, so um, anyway, just kind of a you know, a heads up that that would be a a, a very positive um, sort of way to uh, to, uh, to at least work with um, the concept of hope. Um, in your handout and also in the book, you have a you have charts that look like this, and so these are all the books that I'm talking about this afternoon. Um, and so you see not just the name of the book, but you also see the message. Um, what I think is that probably the most important spaces on these charts are the blank ones, because this is where I would encourage you um, to think of, of other books that, for example, in this case, have to do with feelings and what would be the message that would go with those books. So, again, I've um, given you a start. I also want to point out and you'll see at the, the slide at the end where it talks about various places that you can get my professional book. Um, but also you can get the picture books bundle from Al Rand Books if you would choose to do that. And I know she has one bundle. Allison is a um, person in charge there. Um, she has put together a bundle of just the books that I'm talking about this afternoon. So if you would like those books, that is certainly an option for you. Um, I think next of all, let, let's let's talk about, well, what can we do with these books? And so we've already talked about just a few simple things and some basic questions that we can ask. But I'd also like you to think about, well, you know, certainly we can ask some questions to start conversations. And so in order to do that, I'd like to share with you a strategy that I designed that I call seven thinking boxes. So for this, think Bloom's taxonomy, but it's not exactly a hierarchy. It's just sort of different ways to think about a text. And I've tried to make this, uh, do this in sort of a kid-friendly way so that they can sort of think about their own thinking process. So let's, first of all, talk about what each of these boxes is going to represent. And then we'll just kind of play around with it so that you can see um, what I am really talking about here. So first of all, the plain cardboard box, think basic thinking. Think the kinds of questions um, that you'll find the answer right on the page, just to basically monitor, you know, general um, comprehension. The heart box for feelings, um, certainly any book that you choose um, for social emotional uh, issues is going to have lots of places to talk about feelings. The broken box for problems, um, again, any social emotional issue usually begins with a problem. The treasure box, um, something to treasure that usually gets at the theme, the lesson, whatever, something the character learned, something that you learned as the reader, um, puzzling details. Um, that uh, certainly it's all about evidence from the text, but here like quotes that are especially good, really powerful lines within the text. 
uh, the unusual box for creative thinking. And I think the more we go through other parts of this presentation, you'll see that it's really creative thinking that can get kids beyond some of these cell issues. Um, and the toolbox that really has to do with author's craft so that we're not just talking about um, what the author says, but how the author says uh, says it. So that's, um, that's generally um, what these thinking boxes represent. So what I've done next is here are these boxes applied to the story of Cinderella. That's not one of the books I feature in my um, classroom reading book. However, um, I thought it would be a story that we'd all know. And so you could see how these things apply. I'm showing you this because I'm hoping to give you a stronger sense of how to create your own questions. And so this will just give us a little bit of sort of hands-on with that. So when we ask like, how did the stepsisters take advantage of Cinderella? Um, that answer would be right in the text. That's a good basic, under, uh, a basic question. Notice that all of these um, ultimately will have to do with self-confidence, although um, it, the, the word itself or the term may not appear in the question. Um, what line in this story best shows that Cinderella was at last more confident? Like I said, those puzzling detail things generally take you back to um, particularly important lines that are in a text. Um, is there anyone you feel sorry for in this story? So that's kind of another spin on feelings. Um, so we're not just talking about a feeling of a character, but your your sense of empathy or whatever toward, um, toward a, a, a character. How could Cinderella have solved the problem herself without a fairy godmother? There we go. Thinking of um, problems that we can maybe solve without somebody else kind of intervening. Um, the broken box, how did Cinderella's lack of confidence make her problem bigger? Um, a, the, a great conversation starter there. And, you know, and notice that a lot of these are really inferential questions, questions that don't have one right answer, but really inspire um, good discussion. Um, what? Well, uh, what can the author's message about self-confidence say to you? Always try to take whatever you're talking about for characters and then um, and, and, and then um, bring it to students' own lives because it won't transform them as, um, uh, um, as readers unless we can make that link from the book to themselves. Um, find lines of dialogue in the story and how do they show confidence? So here, we're working on the craft of dialogue, but of course it could be many other things. So that just gives you a sense of, of really what we mean by these questions. Um, you know, feel free to kind of play around with it in the handout as well as in the book. So here's what you're gonna notice. You will notice um, that there's always a set of questions that goes with the featured book. So um, there's 24 like featured areas, 24 featured books and the questions are all there. Um, so that's there for the featured book and it's in your handout on page six. If you look in your handout on page seven, what you'll see there is some generic questions. So these are questions that you can ask um, in regards to feelings about any book. So um, I've tried to, um, to you know, basically um, do some of this work for you to kind of get you started so that you will see what that is all about. I've also given you um, a planning template um, so that you can sort of generate your own questions. This is in the handout, it's in the book, but I honestly feel like the, the best um, way that you would really like this would be um, um, electronically. So I've asked um, Norton if they would, in their follow-up email, send out a copy of this template so that you can save it to your computer and it can just sort of be your master copy. So you can sort of develop your own file of um, questions that will go with some of the books um, that you think are particularly good for sale. So that's the strategy that I would really put out there. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, you'll find plenty of, of um, actual questions for particular books and lots of um, sets of generic questions too. I want to just move on um, quickly now to some of the other focus areas just to give you a taste of um, some of the other things um, that you'll find in the book and some of the other books that we can really highlight here too. So um, accurate self-perception. And so the question here is, who do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see that nice, big, strong, courageous lion? Or do you see scaredy cat? 
Um, I, I, I would say that um, these days when I look at the news, I, I'm afraid I'm more like the scaredy cat, although I know I'm kind of working on it here. Um, but of course, we want kids to feel like they are empowered. Um, so the happiest book that I'm going to share with you this afternoon is this book, Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut. And it's basically the power of a great haircut. So um, this little boy gets a haircut and he just feels like a million bucks and says things like, um, he feels so good, he's going to rearrange the principles on a roll. And he's going to shine so bright that people will need to wear their sunglasses in order in order to just, you know, even get a glimpse of him. So this really sort of got me to thinking, you know, that it's often just those little things that matter most. You know, it's not going to make a lifelong distance, but it's going to make him feel really great right now for a few minutes. And so as we think about this, you know, and, and again, this um, question is, is on that chart that's in your handout, but what little thing could we do so that our students feel so good about themselves that they'll see themselves as a brilliant blazing star. I'd also like you to consider that that changes a bit. You know, when we see our kids in the classroom um, day in and day out, you know, what we can do in that, in that circumstance is different from what we can do in a distance learning um, kind of way. So, you know, think of like, what would really be meaningful to your kids now? What would be most meaningful to uh, meaningful to individual kids when you're back in that classroom set? So that's kind of what that is there. Um, um, thinking um, also just about um, uh, uh, questions for, for kids, find a detail um, that you think best shows the main character or another character um, and how they felt about themselves. You can see that that's a puzzle box question. Um, and, um, you know, certainly a question that we could ask just about any, any, any book at all. As we talk about self-confidence, which is the third area that we want to mention, um, this is really, um, sort of moving the needle from I can't to yes, I can. And what's that really going to take? Um, so again, you know, questions for teachers. One of the things that I think we need to do more of is really just beginning with a conversation about the concept itself. So have you ever had a conversation with your kids about what is self-confidence, why it is so important? Um, I think that that's a good place to begin. Um, I also like to begin with this book, The Paper Bag Princess. Um, a lot of you know this book, but you know the princess has been out trying to slay the dragon to save, to save the prince, her boyfriend, the prince, and comes back. And the uh, the prince is like, you don't look anything like a princess. You know, your hair is a mess, whatever. Come back when you look like a princess. And she says back to him, well, you look really great. You're handsome. You have great hair and clothes. But you know what? You're kind of a bum. And she decides not to marry him after all. So, you know, what kids see and what I think um, they think of as self-confidence is that confident self-confidence is loud and proud. And, yeah, that is the case sometimes. But um, you know, you know, we can sort of consider for that. Why are kids, some kids so confident and others may be equally capable, but not that confident um, at all. And I think the, the message that we need to get across about this is sometimes confidence is not loud and proud. Sometimes confidence is honestly more um, of a whisper than a roar. And the book that we can point to for that is The Little Engine That Could. And we all you know, know this story of the little engine and the um, the other engines that um, would not stop to help the broken engine get the toys over the mountain for the children. And so when this little engine was asked, thought about it for a while and was like, I think I can, right? I think I can. So, you know, the message there is that sometimes you just need enough confidence to try something. So we're not expecting to be that loud and proud thing right away. All we have to do is take the first step and then maybe the step after will follow. I especially like this graphic here. And you can, again, you can find this, just Google like, um, you know, a graphic for self-confidence. And I think this, this will come up. Um, but it really kind of shows how it's sort of an incremental thing. And so, yeah, you start with, I won't do it. And then gradually, gradually you move up and I will do it. And then, yes, I did it. 
So, you know, that's the message that I think that we want to get across to kids. So a question that I think goes well with this is, you know, when the character was not feeling confident, what other feelings did this lead to as well? Because you can see, you know, it just becomes like a domino effect. When you're not confident, you don't try something, then you feel like a failure. You might feel lonely if everybody else is doing it and you're not. Um, and, and so, you know, we really have to go, I think, um, and think about what are the implications. So it's not just the one feeling, but that one feeling can um, be a symptom of something that then goes even, even deeper. So those are the three areas that have to do with self-awareness. And what I'd like you to think about now is, you know, we talked about three of them, um, but you don't have to do them in the order that we discuss them. What you should do is think about, you know, what do your kids really need and start there. So um, anyway, that's probably a good conversation, but let me just kind of move on because I really want to get to the point where we talk about self-management. Um, I mean, all teachers point to impulse, impulse control as just an area, you know, that um, brings down um, their classroom so often. The problem is that kids get to the go part before they do the stop and think part. So we'll talk a little bit here about impulses and about goal setting, although you can see that there are others in this area too. Um, so, you know, something that I think we need to consider right off the bat is what is the, imp the impact of impulsivity in, in my classroom? How does it affect me? How does it affect other children? Because of course it can affect all of you in very many different ways. You know, the first thing would be to, to consider, well, what impulses do we want to reduce? Um, I want to just mention that the books in this category are more um, under the classification of what I would call self-help books for kids. Mostly, I'm really after authentic literature where the lesson kind of emerges organically from just a wonderful story. The, the books here often will address a particular issue and will be very focused just on that. Um, so this is a wonderful book about too much talking. And this kid just mentions um, that, you know, um, these thoughts, they start in her head, then they come down and into her mouth and they push against her teeth and then they just sort of explode right out. And so um, anyway, it's, it's a very cute story. Um, I love stories that add some humor to these things because I think that that's a good way of getting kids um, uh, to, um, uh, to feel that that they can take a risk, that they don't, um, that they don't really have to be, that they, that they don't sort of feel personally targeted by this kind of thing. I also like the book Puppy Mind, which really addresses um, sort of um, kids who are easily distracted. And again, it's very cute. I think this story is actually in rhyme, which makes it, you know, really, really fun. Um, Millie Fierce. Um, so this is a little girl who decides that um, having um, even negative attention is better than getting no attention at all. So she kind of ramps up from being what she considers kind of a wallflower to being this just this kind of wacky kid that says and does inappropriate things. And of course, she kind of learns you know, that that's not the best course. My favorite book here is The Snurge. Um, these are the kids, th this is for the kids that really exhaust us, the kids that run out of the classroom. The kids that um, look over at the, um, at the child next to them and scribble on their paper or do other things that, uh, that, that we do, just don't see coming and um, that just, you know, causes such, you know, mayhem in the classroom. So the, the thought behind this is it's not really you that's doing this. It's your snurch. And yes, we have to get control of this. Um, this is not in any way to excuse this behavior but that we know you are not just this nasty behavior, that there's, there's many good things about you and we just have to figure out a way to get in control of this. So um, anyway, I think that that's a good book that sort of to address that. A question for kids, what creative solution could have helped this character better control his or her emotions? And, you know, well, I think I said before, I, I think, Creative thinking really comes into it, but not in the moment. In the moment, nobody can think creatively or really much of any other way. 
So, you know, after things have calmed down or maybe be proactive and talk about these issues before they arise. Um, and and um, kids really, I think, have lots of good ideas uh, for how these things can be addressed. And then, of course, we hope that they'll transfer some of that thinking when they when they need it most. Um, I want to just talk next about goal setting, um, which is in um, this same area um, of self-management. This may not be something that we are so focused on exactly in the moment, but certainly um, we're always thinking about goals for our kids. Um, so when I begin this, I, I like to think first about who are role models that we can really look at? Um, because, you know, if you can get somebody that kids look up to, I think it's easier to see um, what uh, that goal is and why kids might want to aspire to it. Certainly Nelson Mandela is a wonderful example in showing kids that some goals are really big goals, that they're long-term goals. Um, you know, some kids think that the future is after lunch. I mean, we've got to get them to think a little bit more broadly. Um, I love this Harriet Tubman story, Minty, um, because what the story that it tells is when she was a child, um, that she wanted to run away from the time she was quite young and her father actually tried to help her, but she just couldn't quite make herself do it. And I think sometimes kids have that sense that, you know, if they have a goal and they don't get there right away, that they've failed at it. And that's just not the case. So, you know, some goals do take you longer to achieve. I also like um, this book here, Degas and the Little Dancer. Um, it was a child who wa wanted it, 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 um, so much to be a ballerina, and she took lessons until her family couldn't afford it anymore. Um, but meanwhile, Degas had seen her and wanted to do a sculpture of her. So she was hugely disappointed that she never really became a ballerina. But when she went to this art opening, um, to which um, he he had asked he had asked her to come to this. She saw this sculpture of herself. So the question is, you know, did she achieve her goal? And I think getting kids to consider that sometimes you achieve a goal differently from what you expected, that's a great conversation. And to really look for other examples, current figures, people historically that would sort of fit into that into that kind of a category. Um, a key question here for kids, you know, who set a goal? What was the goal? You know, in so many stories that we read, somebody does have a goal, but we don't always stop and think, of, think about the book in that way. So with a lot of these questions, it's really just using um, questions that you've been asking all along or books that you've been using all along and using it in a slightly different way. Um, I just want to... Um, talk here, um, just one last piece about um, relationship and social skills. And um, so the area that I would like to focus on is just um, communication. And again, you know, what we think about as communication now is maybe different from um, what we would have thought about um, last month or maybe next month. But there's a message here, I think, for all times for all of us. So Again, thinking about a conversation, you know, why is communicate, you know, what is good communication? Why is good communication so important? A book that I just love for this is quite a primary story. Um, it's called The Sandwich Swap. And um, first of all, I'm always looking for characters, um, for books that have Mideastern characters. And this is one. It's about two little girls, Salma and Lily, and they're very good friends. And um, everything is all fine and dandy until... Um, they're eating lunch together one day and they each look at each other's sandwich and goes, oh, that looks yucky or that looks gross. Well, as so often happens, you know, what starts as a little problem grows into a great big problem and other kids begin to take sides and the whole thing culminates in this really horrible food fight in the cafeteria. And of course, the girls get into big trouble and eventually they sort of um, get back together and um sort of very um, uh, uh, quietly, you know, so, sort of asked to taste if, if they can taste each other's sandwich. And when they do, what do you think? Oh, they think it tastes quite delicious. So the message here, you know, good communication means keeping an open mind. So, um, you know, again, I think that that's, uh, um, that that's a communication message for, for all time. I also like this Patricia McKissick book, who is, you know, also a wonderful author when it comes to social emotional things. So this is the story of a little girl who's um, caught by her mom telling this little fib. And she says, well, 
I'm never going to lie again. And the kids are like, well, that's easy. So the message is, you know, be honest, except this little girl takes this to the extreme. So for example, when she sees somebody at church, she's like, hmm, it's a really nice dress, but did you know you have a hole in your sock? So of course, um, you know, this, uh, this doesn't go very well for her. And she ends up losing, you know, sort of a lot of friends along the way here. So she finally realizes, you know, that it's how you tell the truth that matters. So a great message. I think we have a lot of kids that sort of um, tell the truth in, um, you know, very um, clear ways that maybe they could be a little bit more, more subtle about. Um, another um, book that I want to mention to you and a great author, Jacqueline Woodson, um, any, again, any book by Jacqueline Woodson is going to, is going to be worth it. The day you begin, um, there's, there's actually quite a few books out there, um, about newcomers. When I saw this title, I thought, um, and it was the day you begin, I thought begin what? And I was thinking, well, she must mean when you begin at your new school, but that's actually not it. what she really talks about is it's the day you begin to tell your story. And that's when you really begin to fit in. I know this is a sensitive issue because of course, you know, we want kids um, to share what they feel comfortable sharing. And, and, you know, so that really needs to be the extent of it, but how important it, it, it is and how much better communication will be if, um, if kids really do get to know each other. The same message comes across in a slightly different way in this book by Eve Bunting. Honestly, if you just bought all of Eve Bunting's book, you, books, you pretty much have your whole cell curriculum right there. So um, at the beginning of this story, this child um, is also a newcomer and um, makes the remark at the beginning of the book that, you know, not only do the kids not like her, they don't even like her country. And so um, they all go apple picking. This is one of the first days that she's in her new country. And so she's the kid who picks the green apple. And as they go to the cider press to make cider, she goes to throw in the apple and the other kids say, don't, don't put that in there. That's going to change the taste of the whole thing. Well, she does. Of course, this is lovely symbolism. But then when things really change is when she joins in with the other students to help to push the very heavy crank on the cider press. So again, you know, taking the risk, joining in makes all the difference in the end. So a key question for kids here, what caused the communication problem in the story? Um, you know, it's kind of like peeling the onion. Um, a lot of times what's the symptom is not really the cause. Um, and I think that in all the books that we've talked here about communicating, we can sort of just go back and see, you know, you can, you can see um, that it really goes beyond um, what's especially obvious. Um, so those are all the books that I want to talk with you about. Um, you know, I, I'm actually glad that you've got this as a recording because um, we had to go pretty quickly through some of this and maybe having the recording will allow you to go back over this. Um, but I want to um, just mention, um, you know, some of the things that I thought about in choosing good books for sale. Um, which were probably somewhat apparent as we discussed this, but um, but I just wanted to sort of um, have this opportunity for extra clarification. First of all, topics that kids care about right now. And you can see, like I said, that most of these were authentic stories um, where kids saw other children like themselves kind of looking back at them from pages. Um, also, I, I prefer characters um, that are robust. In other words, not like all good or all bad. Um, certainly you can use fairy tales and fables and that kind of thing some of the time, but I really think you want more complex characters. And that's for the most part, what I showed you here. I would also say aim for inclusivity, not just racial diversity. Um, so inclusivity, what do I mean? I mean, like the kids with two moms or two dads, um, cognitive differences, um, even neurological differences, for example, thinking of autism, not as a disability, but as a difference. So there's so much that we can do and so many wonderful books out there. Um, I have many of these books profiled in um, my classroom reading book um, that you can read about there. Um, I also want to mention, you know, that a lot of times um, it, it, it's not, um, certainly we can get some new books and I'm all for that, 
But a lot of times it's the tried and true favorites because you you already know the strengths of those books. Um, it could be the same old book um, with a new self-focus. Remember, any book that you've read with your kids is something that you can go back over um, and now address um, address something for sale. Um, I know I said before, I'll say it one more time, even books that look primary can be useful to older students because it's about the message. And probably most important of all, thinking about books that you that you would be able to add yourself. Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, remember that standardized tests are important, but um, standardized tests don't measure personal strength. Um, and and um, so we've really got to think of personal strength as well as, you know, academic strength for our kids. Um, for even more support, I just also want to mention um, that, you know, that in my book, I've profiled over um, 200 books for you. There's many, many questions for teachers. There's many, many questions for students. There's all sorts of planning sheets beyond even the kind that I showed you in this presentation. Um, I've even provided a list of books perfect for the principal's office. Um, you know, the, the kinds of things for which kids are sort of sent to the principal and thinking that these books could be sort of um, the great equalizer and a great place to begin a conversation. And there's really so much more there. So, um, I, you know, I hope that you'll explore that. Um, I think, like I said, there's a slide that will come up that um, shows you many places where you can acquire the book. So final thoughts here. I mean, any professional development session, I hope you have some big takeaways. I hope you can actually name them. Um, always advocate for yourself. Like, what is your biggest area of need? Who can help you with that? Like, what would be a good next step for you? Um, I hope you're also thinking about um, something to try tomorrow um, and, and maybe something to try long range as well. And then questions that you still have, because that's where, you know, you will continue to be um, a learner, um, you know, uh, certainly yourself. I really like this little graphic here. I think it's a great way to end because I love that the um, that um, that teach is reflected in learn. Um, so um, just kind of a clever way of doing that. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you have a successful um, end of the year, regardless of where that may be. Um, and I appreciate that you took the time um, to participate in this webinar. So I think I'll just turn it back over now to Carol or to um, the team um, for some finish up slides. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Nancy. That was wonderful. Um, and as you can tell, uh, there, there was so much information imparted and so much more um, in the book. Um, so thank you both to Nancy and everyone who made time to participate and to listen to today's webinar. Um, to continue learning how to connect the dots between social emotional learning and literacy. Please check out Nancy's new book, Classroom Reading to Engage the Heart and Mind, available today. Um, you can order directly from Norton to receive 20% off and free shipping. Um, and for schools interested in adopting the book for professional learning, please contact us at education at www.norton.com to learn about um, our 45% discount for schools ordering 10 copies or more. That was absolutely wonderful, Nancy. Do you have any parting words or <laughs> shall we simply say? Um, no, I mean, I, I do have just a couple of thoughts um, of, of things that we didn't talk about. So, I mean, you, you really can't, um, I don't think talk about scheduling too much um, because everybody's school schedule is so different. Mm -hmm. But certainly one of the things to keep in mind um, is that you don't need all that much time for this. You know, if you have a couple of, say, 15-minute segments throughout a week, you can read a story in 15 minutes, talk about it in 15 minutes. So, I mean, I think you can start small for something like that. So, you know, don't be afraid just to kind of, you know, dip your toe in the water to get started. The other thing um, that I'll just address quickly is, um, you know, I, I certainly know that there's many schools that are very focused on sort of the academics and those scores still, but, you know, for extra um, support for, uh, for um, being uh, more inclusive of things like Cell, you know, I, I think it's good to keep in mind that Cell, according to the research, can really increase kids' academic scores by about 11%. That's quite a bit. 
Um, and for something that virtually doesn't cost any money, I mean, it's just books that you have in your classroom or books that you'd probably like to purchase anyway. Um, so, you know, um, I, I would say that those are two good additional points for thinking about incorporating cell. Hmm. And, and convincing it, administrators that it, it's important for your kids. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. Thank you for all of you who are listening. And um, we'll sign up. Thank you.